really excited to have you back on the show. Um, I know you were on before, Dr. Will C. Uh, to talk about chronic pain, and actually got a really lot of great feedback um, from that episode. I think Joe told me it was one of his favorite episodes that, he, that he's listened to. But for those that are just tuning in for the first time and don't know anything about you, can you do a little bit of an introduction? Sure, yeah. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. Before we get into our conversation, I want to acknowledge that I am here standing and living and working and playing on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil peoples. Wonderful. And I am here in New Jersey, northwestern New Jersey, and Lenny Lenape um, people. There might have been some others, but primarily Lenny Lenape land. Oh, great. Uh, so I'm a medical doctor, background in family medicine, and my medical practice is focused in chronic pain and mental health. And uh, yeah, along the way, over the last decade or so in my career, I've continued to explore um, things beyond the, the typical biomedical Western paradigm that might help uh, my patients. And that's just led me down a rabbit hole of other learning and certified through the Institute for Functional Medicine. And from there, went on to get certification to teach mindfulness-based stress reduction, and then really became aware of the impact of trauma. So I did a two-year certification in relational somatic therapy to become a trauma therapist. And part of that was to situate myself from my own perspective as legitimately uh, ready to put myself forward to be a therapist for the MAPS MDMA uh, clinical research, uh, which I had discovered alongside discovering Gabra Mate's work with ayahuasca in around 2012. And all of that really captivated me and uh, kind of added to the path I'd already been on. And so for over the last decade, I've been fascinated with psychedelics, uh, both, both pers- personally and professionally. And now I'm working with uh, a company, Numinous Wellness, as their senior lead of psychedelic programs. So I'm writing programs, uh, clinical protocols, training our therapists internally, and I'm also doing some clinical research. I'm a co-investigator on the MAP USX study, which is the crossover arm of the first phase three MAPS PTSD study. So we've got participants who are finally going to get the active treatment, not the placebo. Oh, wonderful. Also, yeah, it's great. And they've been waiting almost two years. Wow. Um, and uh, also I'm a therapist for that study. And then some of my original clinical research is looking at um, MDMA for PTSD and some accessory data on pain, which I talked about um, in the other podcast, and then working with Will on a, on a pilot for MDMA for fibromyalgia. So lots of different hats I'm wearing. You know, yeah, I do you ketamine assisted therapy. Very accomplished. And... I, I remember yeah. reading your bio for the intro. I was like, whew, you're doing a lot and have done a lot already. It's fun. And I love, I love the variety. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. really great. I'm I'm right there with you. I like to kind of wear different hats and do a lot of different things. I have that energy. Yeah. I, I think I get bored quickly sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that introduction. So we, we start this uh, series off with a question. And that question is, what do you think is the most vital psychedelic conversation people should be having right now? Yeah, right now, I think the most vital conversation is really looking at biomedical ethics as it applies mm. to psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, not everyone necessarily, uh, especially folks in the underground, but even people practicing clinically get, I think, enough exposure to ethics um, in, the, in our training. Of course, we have ethical codes of conduct, and, uh, but to really think critically through the lens of ethics and, and then how that applies. And there's some really important, unique considerations uh in, for psychedelic assisted therapy that we could certainly talk about yeah can you take into that and maybe for those that maybe haven't heard that term biomedical ethics could you maybe define that a little bit more sure i mean it has a lot to do with you know um our hippocratic oath as physicians right to do no harm that's related to the biomedical ethic of non-maleficence uh, there's also an ethic of beneficence which is to do well for our patients um for their benefit. And then there's also an ethic of uh, supporting patient autonomy, which has a lot to do with informed consent and um, decision-making. And then uh, there's justice-based ethics, which has a lot to do with our rights to freedom of thought, consciousness, and religion, uh, as it applies to psychedelics uh, specifically. Um, So 
So those are the kind of main categories when we're thinking about biomedical ethics. It's just the field of ethical inquiry as it applies to you know, research involving human subjects and as well as clinical practice in any discipline, helping discipline. And it's super important because we want to be protecting uh, patients' rights and protecting them from, from this lens so that we are not doing harm and that we are doing well for, for people. So, um, so that's kind of like the gist of it. Um, and then I can go into each of that, each of those categories as it relates to psychedelics, if you want. Yeah, I think that would be wonderful and really interesting to hear. Yeah, I think um, one of the ones I think about a lot is that right to um, autonomy as well as the right to freedom of thought, consciousness and uh, belief or religion, because uh, psychedelics pose unique vulnerabilities. Yeah. Uh, there's enhanced suggestibility. Uh, and when you also look through the lens of, you know, a feminist ethic, which is essentially an anti-oppression lens, we see all relationships as having inherent power dynamics, especially a, a provider and then a person seeking care. There's always a power dynamic built in. And when you add a medicine into that equation, that you all of a sudden get this amplification of the, of the gap in that power dynamic. And so the person's suggestibility is enhanced. They're going willingly into a state of openness, trusting you, and even being encouraged to surrender and, um, and going into states where we know that they can have noetic experiences where things that they experience as true in that moment actually have extra relevance and extra truth. And these experiences can have enduring impacts you know, neurobiologically, psychologically, people years later will still say, oh, that was the most important or meaningful spiritual experience of my life. So the repercussions and the impact of this work is, is really great. So this is part of the, the unique vulnerability when we know that set and setting, or as Carhart Harris talks about it, context or like extra pharmacological factors like environment and, um, the mindset and how a person is prepared to enter the experience actually does impact outcomes. That combined with the role as the guide or facilitator in actually creating that environment, helping the person establish that mindset, um, you know, we have a profound uh, influence on the experiences people are going to have. So uh, I think that what it's incumbent upon us as, as guides or facilitators or helping professionals to be very aware of this power role that we have and very aware of ourselves and our own uh, biases, to be looking at our implicit biases, constantly doing you know that self-inquiry and self-investigation work so that we are not unconsciously perpetrating harm. I mean, there's conscious perpetration of harm, which also happens where people use the power dynamic to take advantage of people con consciously. We want to put safeguards in and around this work absolutely to protect people from conscious perpetration. But this it's more this unconscious perpetration where people are wide open, suggestible, and then maybe I'm subtly influencing the meaning they're making uh, because of my own ideologies and right. beliefs and yeah but i think it's a, a very very important conversation right now i think so as well yeah um something that just kind of popped up in my head as you're talking about like the importance of set and setting and i'm also just thinking like protocols too and doing no harm um mm -hmm. you know something i think was challenged me a little bit was <clears throat> coming from you know this graphian framework breath work this and that but then um being able to then offer ketamine therapy with folks like actually changing it a little bit and there's a part of me that's like i want to keep this model this is what i'm you know really kind of trained in and, and understand but then being able to weave in some of the more somatic trauma informed approaches and realizing I really kind of need to listen to the client and see like kind of what they're needing it at times. And so, yeah, I'm wondering if that's part of it too, like reflecting on our own agenda, how we're creating the space, also thinking about how we're dictating the session. Um, and mm -hmm. it's been really interesting to be more kind of like uh, co-collaborating uh, that space mm -hmm. together. Mm hmm yeah, you know, I can reflect around developing our uh, our programs and numinous and 
what considerations are in there. Of course, a lot, a lot around informed consent. So really explaining our therapeutic model up front, being able to answer questions about it, um, risks and harms, and also taking a super uh, person-centered approach. Like you say, you know, where you're listening, like, what do you value? What works for you? And, you know, that person-centered approach is actually embedded in um, a relationship-centered care approach as well, which we, you know, it, it's an attempt to a, a little bit uh, close that gap between you know, this big power differential where we're, we're really viewing our interactions with clients as being collaborators with them and really listening to um, what they value while also explaining what may be some of the non-negotiables about the way we might be approaching this, things around safety. Um, right. You know, we definitely take a trauma-informed approach. And I mean, I don't think a client would say, oh, I don't want that. Although, um, you know, it's all of our approaches are, are anti-oppression based and um, really uh, attempting to uh, empower choice, um, empower agency and um, a sense of relational safety and um, really having a voice and being able to make that voice known um, and heard, which when people are vulnerable and they're coming and maybe have some pretty severe mental health conditions can already be really hard. Um, it, with anybody, never mind uh, with a practitioner. So, um, yeah, I think those conversations are important to at, at the at the get go really listen and realize that how we're setting up even the consent process is already starting is part of prep and set and so, is yeah. is going to influence um, their experience in in the medicine. So from from first point of contact is really when we need to be thinking about all of these things. Yeah. Thinking about like, I guess, challenging some of those power dynamics at times and something that popped in my head was like really helping to cultivate agency within the client. And I wonder if you've ever like bumped up against any challenges around that from and, and I'm just thinking about some of my own experiences of going to a professional thinking that they're the ones with the answers and actually mm -hmm. trying to develop my own sense of agency is really hard and be like, I don't know what I need. Right. This is why I came to you. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I wonder if there's like a lot of kind of unlearning that sometimes needs to be done on the client side or, or how are you approaching that? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's multiple considerations. Of course, one of them being that the the dominant healthcare paradigm and model that everyone is conditioned to and implicitly kind of going along with for the most part is quite an oppressive system where it is like external experts tell you what's wrong with you and you passively accept the treatments. And, you know, when that is overlaid on folks who have had trauma through developmental periods, where they haven't had a nurturing environment that supports the, even the development of a healthy sense of self, self and agency, there's going to be unmet developmental needs that are going to, you know, uh, not necessarily, but understandably in many cases lead to this desire to be saved, right? Because when, when there was an external person, adult caregiver that was meant to be that for you and you didn't get it, of course, as, as adults, you know, there might be this proclivity towards you know, interacting and engaging with a system that's going to just fix you as because um, when we aren't um, a, seen as autonomous individuals as children and when the adults around us aren't inquiring, um, how are you doing? What do you need? Anticipating our needs, teaching us that it's even OK to have needs and wants and desires. Um, we we lose touch with the fact that that might even be possible, right? So that can impact our sense of agency. So I think, you know, thinking about it through sort of societal context and what we're all, you know, conditioned to and also these developmental um, uh, considerations so that, you know, in therapy with someone, um, I can keep all of that in mind. And, and part of the work therapeutically may be to help that person learn to be able to listen inside and name needs and or even um, give themselves permission or have like a corrective, you know, relational experience where they are being asked and it might bring up discomfort. And but that's something that's worked through together, because ultimately, you know, um, we do carry a responsibility as 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 caregivers and therapists with the knowledge and skills we have. And it's not mm -hmm. like we're dismissing any of that, uh, but it's really about um, assisting and supporting people to come into a level of engagement where 
um, we're meeting them as they are and with their own um, uh, beliefs and um, in, intentions and and assisting appropriately without overlaying our own onto them oh, where yeah. the temptation may be to do that right and that can happen through transference and counter transference like the transference they may put on us is like please save me yeah. and then the and then the counter transference that a helping professional might have going into a helping profession may be like this unconscious need to be someone's savior there you go you're going to be in a therapeutic enactment unless mm -hmm. You're aware of that unconscious um, bias, you know, and working on that as a therapist. Yeah. And I guess outside of the psychedelic world a little bit, maybe thinking about just uh, those that are working within the systems and insurance companies, just even thinking about the agenda of that agency, right? Like sometimes people come in and it's like, you know, the agency, the organization, the insurance companies may try to dictate um, how you're treating clients. And then so that's the other kind of power uh, dynamic that I think a lot of clinicians and therapists, like they get involved because we want to help. And then you kind of then butt up against these uh, systemic kind of powers and you go, oh, and that can be so draining for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Fortunately, in Canada, we don't, I think, have as quite as much of that with a single payer system in our, you know, universal healthcare. But that Universal healthcare is absolutely limited, you know, in what it covers, and it doesn't cover psychotherapy. And so we do have third party, mm. and and there, I think there's unique frustrations, you know, across our border. I think a lot of people in the states think we have it really made up here with our healthcare system, and I think we have a long way to go. It's it's just different, and it's you know complex. Yeah, not every it's system's going to be perfect, right? There's always no, be the pros definitely and cons. not. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> awesome. So we went over the one ethics. Um, what are some of the other ones that you wanted to dig into or other examples? Yeah, I mean, so like non-maleficence is another one, like to do no harm. And uh, we might get into this a little bit more about use of touch, not using touch. So an example there is um, if somebody is an, in, under the effect of a psychedelic and there's particular need for reassurance and safety that may come up for them, Maybe they're even contacting um, like a regressed developmental state, something pre-verbal where at the time developmentally, what was really needed and not given was safe, nurturing and supportive touch, which we know there's tons of research that shows that children neglected of from touch go on to have all kinds of different sequelae later in life, you know, um, deviance and behavioral and addictive disorders. Um, even like higher incidence of physical disorders like cancer and other chronic diseases, because that that input is so important um, physically and psychologically. And so if a person is in that state and we we do not provide anything that would provide a sense of containment and contact, um, then we might be actually doing harm like a harm of neglect even recapitulating the harm of neglect that was there in the first place. So um, that's that's another um, unique kind of example that could come up and maybe leads a little bit into the discussion of, of touch in this work. I know this is a much complicated topic, and I think um, especially now, you know, coming from the breathwork world, body work and touch has been a really important part of that process. Um, and I, you know, I've seen the importance. I've personally experienced the importance of it. Um, and I think after yeah a lot of recent events, um, you know, this topic has been coming to light um, with discussion. I don't know if you've been following the, the cover story power trip series. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's challenging. You know this this concept of touch as well. Um, and so yeah, this is a really tricky thing to navigate. And I think you know I mm -hmm. maybe even heard some of their narrative around well, you know, is there actually any research of not intervening with touch it can be harmful, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know. Yeah, it's I think it's a, a very nuanced conversation and something that we really have to consider moving forward um, I did watch the video that, that they posted and you know mm -hmm. one of my my reactions was and in, in breath work like you know it seemed like you know, I'm just projecting what I saw here and making observations but it seemed like there was an agenda there right and from mm -hmm. like our training it's we don't do that unless somebody is asking for it or needs it, right? Yeah. And so we have to really pull back our agenda, even though we may think touch can be helpful, 
um, to yeah. pull back and not even consider it unless somebody is possibly asking for it. Um, yeah. you, know, you could ask if they, they want to engage in it, but then I know, you know, especially under medicine, where does informed consent come into play, right? And then um, mm -hmm. people are talking about, can people actually make informed decisions while they're under the influence of medicine? Mm -hmm. Even though you talked about it prior, you know, does it change? Mm -hmm. And you're talking about this vulnerability and people are more open during medicine sessions. Like, does that change? Do people then go, hmm, did I actually want that during the session? So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's lots of nuance here and it's yes. such a, a big important discussion and something I really just urge as people are getting more involved in this um, and maybe you do have training in touch and, and body work to you know really think about a lot of these things and think about why you want to include that um, in, into your practice. Yeah I mean the consent process again this ties into ethics right the consent process around touch needs to be really robust um, and so that means explaining um, the purpose of touch if it were to be used. I always gauge a client's sensitivity and openness to touch on a scale of one to 10. And some clients are like 10 out of 10, it's fine. I'm totally comfortable, no problem. And others are really like not sure. And so we come to a place where it's like, okay, if we're going into a medicine session, what's your level of comfort? And I would give examples of possible types of touch. It could just be holding a hand, um, a hand on the shoulder or maybe on the back. Um, one of the principles with touch is that you're you're going to least vul less vulnerable areas. So vulnerable being like inside surfaces, front of body surfaces are, are more vulnerable areas. Mm -hmm. And according also to your your training and, and proficiency. Um, and and then when in a medicine session, if a client who said absolutely not, I'm zero out of ten, I'm not open to touch, then asks for it then my approach and what we teach in Numinous with our therapists is that we would not use touch, but we would offer a touch alternative or titration. So mm. an alternative would be, okay, um, can you imagine what it might be like if, like if I did place my hand on your hand right now, or maybe you could try holding your own hand and see how that feels. Or how about I use this weighted cushion and place that over your hand and you can just, uh, and, and my hands on the other side of it. You know, so we're connected without me physically touching them at all. And then in integration, we would then go, okay, so you did ask for touch. How are you feeling about it now? Did you want to renegotiate your consent around touch for next time? So that we're never actually um, going beyond what they say before they're in an altered state of consciousness, but we can use alternatives so we don't um, have that harm of neglect happening. Yeah. And I guess, do you bring that up in the informed consent if say, you know, they say a zero out of 10 around touch, and then it comes up in the medicine session that they want it. So you're kind of prepping them beforehand saying, hey, if you bring yeah. this up during, we may not engage because we want to just be in a safe place. Yeah, we'll engage with alternatives. And that might look like A, B or C, right? Cool. So that really they, they know what to expect in, in, in all circumstances. Yeah. 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 That's really smart. Mm -hmm. Really important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... I saw those videos too, and uh, you know, like like full frontal spooning with clients, not in the way that we are conducting things. Um, there's just you know, especially with people with um, structural dissociation and trauma, and not a, a strong core sense of self or agency, like we were talking about. You know, that can just be there can be such internal confusion around touch and what it means. And there can be parts like from an IFS internal family systems perspective, parts that are starved for touch and, and would drink that up. Yeah. But then there may be other parts that are terrified of it. And so, you know, they can be at odds with each other. So we have to tread so, so carefully. And um, Kathy Kane in her book, um, Nurturing Resilience, co-authored Stephen Terrell. There's a whole chapter on touch. I actually, I studied touch skills for trauma therapy with Kathy and it was a great oh, training. Yeah, and so there's a table in that book in the touch chapter that says when not to use touch, when to use caution with touch and when it's appropriate. And examples are like when not to use is when the therapist doesn't know what else to do. That is not an appropriate right. time to use touch or for the therapist to self-soothe themselves, right? Not an appropriate use of touch. So we need to be super, super conscious about our motivations and what the intention and purpose is. 
Yeah, one of the um, things our our teachers at Dream Shadow always kind of say is like doing by not doing, especially when you have that urge to really want to intervene and Mm -hmm. like utilize touch or or body work. It's like, yeah, can we get away without that, right? Like, Mm -hmm. does this person actually really need it? Um, What are some tips that you would give and and maybe some resources for um, people that are listening that may are maybe involving touch in their practice? Um, Just to like think about how to navigate this. Mm -hmm. Well, that book I just mentioned, uh, which I imagine you can put in the show notes, another book that has a whole chapter on touch that I read and I recently studied with the author, Somatic Internal Family Systems. So her chapter, Susan McConnell's chapter. I have it right on my bookshelf uh, up there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Her chapter on touch, I think, is, is great. And from the IFS perspective is talking about really being in embodied self energy before ever um, using touch. So, and it kind of goes into really what that means, but that means essentially, you know, in a nutshell, it's we don't have a protector part or some other part that's blended. And then we're using touch with our clients because there's gonna be ulterior motives. And it's actually coming from an embodied, centered, conscious self energy place. Um, I think that's really, really important to kind of learn what that is, what that means, and then how to how to navigate from that place with with touch. Um, I think those are those are some of the big two, uh, really, that I that I've leaned into in my personal practice. Yeah. And I guess, um, I don't know how it is in, in Canada, but yeah, I mean, touch for therapists, there's obviously really not a lot of training, at least here in the States. And, you know, it's always like cautioned against any sort of touch with a therapist or with a client. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like kind of even challenging a little bit of how the, the field operates. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's been a real pendulum swing, right? Because I think very, very early days, early psychoanalytic sort of Freud times, um, touch was used, but then it got conflated with sexual impulses and people were violated and um, the, you know, the field swung the opposite way when it was uncovered, you know, how much violation and un- inappropriate touch uh, was, was happening um, and, and, you know, kind of a zero tolerance uh, approach, which is an understandable prerogative to, to protect people. Um, But then uh, in the last few decades uh, or more, with the emergence of more uh, trauma-informed and somatic modalities and more research and neuroscientific research on um, the nervous system and development and the importance of touch, touch is our first sense that we develop when we're in utero that has so much to do with our boundaries as a human. You know, the skin, it's a boundary organ and lack of touch and, and the implications of it these modalities have explicitly and conscientiously involved um, safe and appropriate use of touch because when done well, it is absolutely a powerful and potentially very healing intervention. Um, And so it's kind of like the black or white approach doesn't necessarily protect against harms. You know, people who are going to perpetrate will still perpetrate. Um, There may be, you know, consequences if they do and they're caught. But I think what's more important for us to think about um, as it relates to touch, transference, countertransference stuff, and um, potentially, you know, violations of folks sexually or with touch, is it's really our own unprocessed wounding related to touch or related to sex and sexual energy that is what makes us vulnerable to perpetration with our clients or to conscious or unconscious. So, you know, I think. Um, a more sophisticated approach than black or white, yes or no, is encouraging um, the the development uh, as practitioners within communities of practice um, to to really continue to look at ourselves and make sure that we're processing any of our discomfort with touch or with talking about sex, because it's always gonna be rooted in whatever our historic, you know, wounds or conditioning is. And if we're not aware of that and working through it, it, it can bleed through. And then that's really what is um, the vulnerable vulnerability factor there. Yeah, and it makes me just think like not having any training in it and taking this like black or white approach where it's like, yeah, like should we actually have be more have more training around this so people are able to, you know, develop competency around it and not yeah. be so afraid of it, right? Because when we yeah. just push it away, then this is I feel like when things really start to unfold in, in a harmful way. Um Absolutely. I feel like it's almost kind of like harm reduction. I mean, when you said black or white, it's like, yeah, don't do drugs, right? And it's like, well, exactly. we know that doesn't really work. We need to have more open conversations <laughs> just say no. and yeah. 
yeah. yeah yeah so on the on the do no harm any other um I, I know we're talking about like physical harm but would you know are there any other examples within there from the ethical perspective well, I mean, I think the other ones I spoke to certainly translate over, right? So um, just understanding that the harm we may unconsciously uh, uh, cause if we are unconscious of our personal biases and other things that we may bring in um, when a person is in a suggestible state. So um, they may that may seem quite subtle, but, but the impact actually can be quite profound. And we really want to, you know, I think it's almost like a, a therapeutic stance of reverence for this human being, what their intentions are, you know, what, what they're hoping to get from this, what they're comfortable with and, and really getting to know them and, and having that, um, deep appreciation for them as autonomous humans that are going to make their own meaning and and really looking to dis, um, to see any um, subtle motivations we might have um, to think you know that if, if this person aligns with the way I see this this way that's been helpful for me in my life then I'm doing a good thing we're really no not necessarily so I think um, those types of harms that I think we often are not as as tuned into um, because it's not you know like a physical act of violation, uh, but are are absolutely relevant um, when people are so open and suggestible and where things have so much meaning and could, can potentially alter the course of their life. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. And then. I didn't count um, how many ethics that you proposed there, but I think three or four. So there's there's two more or one more to explore here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the beneficence thing, it's more just we need to be checking in that what we're doing, like any medical intervention or therapeutic intervention has to have enough, you know, validity as an intervention that we know that there is potential for benefit, for example. So much of that is, is taken care of, you know, through the research and that we can offer these things as interventions. But I mean, maybe we, we may not assume that, right? We uh, certainly in above ground contexts, we're not going to be um, offering any interventions that don't have a sound empirical um, evidence base, but that, that may not be this, you know, in all contexts. Yeah. Um, the other thing, you know, with respect to justice-based rights and freedom of uh, thought and consciousness, when we exert undue influence, um, that's when we're, that's when we're committing a violation in that regard. And so that potential for undue influence is amplified with psychedelics. And what is undue and influence? Undue influence is like when the, when we, we do something without informed consent or without um, enough of a benef beneficence justification. And, and we're unduly influencing this person related to um, all those aspects of their being uh, without without that justification to to help them and and their informed consent about that we're doing that, mm. um, so so we just and because informed consent is so tricky as well. Like we didn't talk about that specifically, but it's hard to do informed consent to something that we don't know necessarily what the person's experience is going to be. Yeah, um, and uh, also you know, really making sure that we're consenting people around the understanding that all of these elements of the environment and how we prepare you are, are relevant to outcomes and, you know, being really thorough with that. But there's this kind of understanding problem with informed consent that is relevant with psychedelics. It's that makes it tricky. So again, it just heightens the importance of consideration of all these factors together and how much care we need to bring. Yeah, this is something that we've talked about on the show and also in our our classes. Like, yeah, what is psychedelic informed consent and how much do you give away? Like, you know, thinking about how much do you prep somebody for a bad experience, right? And then for me, it gets into 
like um, just this concept of are we preparing people for negativity or negative experience if we're constantly like saying that. So I just uh, remember do, doing a breathwork introduction and I'm sitting there telling them the variety of transpersonal experience that, that can occur and, you know, kind of going a little bit through Groff's uh, perineal birth matrices and somebody's like, why the hell would I want to do this? This just sounds terrifying, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, it got me thinking, like, how much information should I give away um, during kind of like this introduction? It's like obviously enough to have people make safe, informed decisions around what they're about to engage in. But then, yeah, when does it cross over to be maybe a little too much? Um, so yeah, I've, I've thought about this a little bit. And, yeah, I wonder uh, hear your opinions about that as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we don't really know, but there may be aspects of of psychedelics and their impacts that may make them, you know, ultimately like super placebos. You know, I mean, the scientific notion of a placebo. Um, I think placebo is, is actually really relevant to healing, and we ought to be harnessing placebo. Um, you know, which is benefits that come simply through expectations alone of, of, of benefits, right? And a person believes this is going to be good, and then it actually does enhance the benefit. And then yeah. nocebo being the opposite, where, you know, I say, I'd, I think you are going to live maximum three more weeks as a doctor, right? With, yeah. From my position of authority or whatever, how can I actually predict that? I mean, I think that type of prognosticating is 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 not really a valid thing to be doing. Um, and what's the impact when somebody really believes that to be true yeah. because of my position of power and authority? So nocebo is where there's a negative impact because of negative expectancy, just like you're saying. But I think the question we need to ask with informed consent is, if something happens later that's negative to a person, from their engagement in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and we haven't told them that that was a possibility then we have not done our due diligence in proper informed consent so i think uh, we just need to come to informed consent with neutrality and um, emphasize that yes there there may be benefits and yes there may also be harms and we need to let you know of all of these and you know when you go into a surgery they have to tell you you know there's a risk of death and all these things and we still sign off on the, you know, surgical form, but there's very small risk things. And I think we just need to portray them as very low risk things if we know that yeah. to be true so that we aren't, as you say, priming people. People do have a lot of fear going into psychedelic experiences naturally because for people, especially who are psychedelic naive, never having taken them before, this is entering an, uh, a state where you you may, you can lose control and you don't know what's going to happen. It's the unknown, which is essentially like the our parallels are our most primal fear of death, yeah. <laughs> right? So, um, so we we can be conscious that people are coming in with some of with these anxieties and fears, but really try to be as neutral as possible in portraying benefits and harms, and and we just need to do it. Yeah, I yeah. think it's it's really important. Um, yeah, because, you know, I, I hear some people kind of uh, joining you know, some underground circles with no sort of like informed consent, had no idea what they're getting into. Or um, also, I've been hearing this a bunch lately, and I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> like people not telling clients or the participants what type of medicines they're going to be receiving. And I'm just oh. like, that yeah. is just what is going on there, right? Like you sign I'm up being for... Told you're going to see God and have this most mystical experience of your life. And then they take five methoxy DMT and they don't have that experience. Yeah. They have something maybe terrifying and then, you know, and then they don't have an opportunity to integrate that and then come out the other side going, well, with, I think, you know, importantly, their, their toxic shame compounded. Yep. There's something really wrong with me. I didn't have the experience I was supposed to have. It's probably because I'm, fundamentally internally defective and flawed in some way which is that belief of toxic shame which is what happens when we have relational deprivation in, in childhood and it's, it's so endemic i mean it's, it's very very common so yeah being told something is going to happen and creating expectations and uh, you know all of these things are uh, have a lot of potential to to harm folks i think on. those are some of the more challenging psychedelic integration um challenges that people can like or that i've like worked with where people were really expecting something and then 
being sold this kind of narrative and then feeling like an utter failure being like Absolutely. what's wrong with me I'm broken like this worked for so many people I'm never yeah. gonna kind of heal and it's like yeah I think we need yeah. to be really careful around how we talk about these substances and there's sometimes where I feel a little jaded I'm like oh am I coming off like too kind of cautious when I talk to people but I think it's important right to oh, yeah. know the range of experience things that can get worse before they get better you know increased emotion after experiences is totally normal and yeah um, and that whatever you do experience is valid because it's what you experienced and our role to help people integrating is to help them find the meaning and make and make sense of whatever that experience was even if it was really profoundly challenging and difficult and not what they hoped for or expected and um you know i think another uh pretty common a uh, challenge for integration is if people have biographical memories that that come to them, like being abused by their yeah. father or something, or, you know, there's an example in the literature of one of the uh, patients or participants at the Imperial College psilocybin for depression study who had this um, sensation of being an infant and being smothered by a pillow and then came out going, is it true? Like, right. did that happen? And then really um, people can get very fixated and want their therapist to tell them, you know, did it happen? Is it true? And, and wanting to have like this rational uh, truth, yes or no. And it's like, well, what do we do with that as therapists? How question. do we assist yeah. people? Yeah. And so, you know, from my training as a relational somatic therapist, it's actually not about the facts or details of what happened that matter. In fact, we can resolve trauma without even recollection of facts or details because we're mm-hmm. working with how it shows up in the body and how it's showing up emotionally, right? So that we might actually help that person to consider, well, when you when you think about the possibility that it might be true, what, kind, what do you notice happening in, in your felt experience, right? And then might say, oh, I feel like tension somewhere. And we just get them to explore and track and start to look to their bodies and move energy as it's coming up. And in the end, they may or may not come to a place of acceptance that they don't need to know. They may or may not actually come to a sense of real knowing, actually, this did happen or, you know, it didn't happen, but it's symbolic of something. And right. but it's that's for them to come to. And we can assist that process through working with what's actually emergent in the felt experience and not needing to stay adherent to the narrative around it. I think that's wonderful advice. Yeah, because sometimes, yeah, people get really fixated on that and sometimes can really derail them, right? Like where they have that memory recall and that was very real, right? Yeah. Um, And was that real? I don't know. And then it just really throws people for a loop. Um, But yeah, I I tend to take your approach to like coming back to more felt experience. and Yeah. I was actually really pleased to see published very, very recently was an article. It was in Transpersonal Psychiatry Journal um, on the topic of ethics and this particular type of situation. Um, That example was used in the paper and it's um, authored by Timmerman, Rosalind Watts and Dupuis. And they're they're presenting a model that they're looking at, um, you know, um, empathic resonance and using the principles of Rosalind Watts' accept, connect, embody model to do exactly what I just spoke about, which is actually just inquiring into felt experience and helping the person make meaning and um, focusing on it that way. So I was really pleased to see that. Uh, was that out. just recent? Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. I'll have to recent. check that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, cool. Looks like we have a little bit over 15 minutes left. So we'll uh, transition over to the next question. Um, and that is, what is the most vital teaching point that psychedelic practitioners need to become skilled and expert in? Yeah, I was thinking about this question, uh, and I I think for me, it boils down to uh, mindfulness. So I don't know that that's necessarily a teaching point. Mindfulness is a skill and it's a disposition. And the reason mindfulness is my answer is because when we actually cultivate true mindfulness, it's not, uh, mindfulness is maybe a bit of a misnomer. You know, we might consider actually it to be bodyfulness. Um, just this capacity or ability to attend to the full spectrum of our lived experience, to be able to give it description uh, moment to moment to moment. And when we cultivate that capacity, then there's like a whole tree of things that are also Mm. super relevant to this work 
that we are then enabled to bring to the fore as therapists, like our introceptive awareness, our awareness of our nervous system, our capacity to self-regulate ourselves. You know, when we cultivate mindfulness, we have much more capacity for emotional self-regulation, physical self-regulation. And that's super important when people are in wide open states of consciousness and having high charge, you know, uh, as far as their nervous system and emotions uh, are concerned, high charge states that we can, we can be a physical ground, that we can um, co-regulate, you know, like it's not just what we say as therapists, but it's the quality of our presence and this, you know, nervous system to nervous system, body to body communication that's going on all the time underneath the words and almost more um, powerfully than the words sometimes that we yeah. might drop into the space. So, Right, because um, so much of that is nonverbal, right? And exactly. like if, if people are noticing a little bit of that anxiety or, ooh, I'm feeling a little bit nervous around what's happening, you know, people can internalize that and say, is, is this right? Like, what, what's going on here? I think about something that Stan wrote in LSD Psychotherapy. Yeah, the job of the, the sitter, the guy, the therapist is to really be that grounding rod, um, mm -hmm. to, you know, be that foot in, in, in reality when people are just totally blown out and aren't too sure what reality is at that point mm -hmm. um so i mm -hmm. i keep coming back to i think the importance is like some of these fundamentals um learning how to regulate our nervous system learning how to sit because i think this also helps out with some of the ethical dilemmas that we coming into that, that we were just Absolutely. discussing right like i'm noticing a bit of discomfort because i'm feeling uncomfortable around you know this this going on and i need yeah. to intervene to make myself feel comfortable and it's like how do we really yeah be more yeah. mindful more embodied listen to our nervous systems and yeah. Yeah. The yeah. cues to uh, actually become aware when there may be some counter transference happening. So many of them are embodied cues that we might attend to if we ha are practiced in sustaining, you know, attention to ourselves while we're attending to another, like dual awareness is some, is a skill yeah. that comes from cultivation of mindfulness. And it's like, am I leaning in? Am I hunching my shoulders? Am I, am I leaning back? You know, is my stomach tightening? You know, is this related to my stuff or is this some empathic resonance I'm having? And maybe being able to make those discernments and then to check like, oh, yeah, I feel like I am kind of getting personally drawn in here and being able to in the moment shelve that. And if we aren't attendant to those cues, it can be much harder for us to be aware that they're happening. And um, Pat Ogden, who uh, is the, the founder of Sensory Motor Psychotherapy, uh, wrote an article, I think it was in a, a book, Healing Moments in Psychotherapy, that was um, edited by Dan Siegel. And it's all mm. about somatic transference and countertransference. And it talks about, you know, what's between the words and how we can attend to that so that we can be so much more self-aware of these entanglements that we can get into um, that are even beyond the words that are being spoken. And, and again, it boils down to mindfulness and those capacities to, to catch ourselves in those yeah. moments. Do you have any favorite practices, techniques, anything yeah, practical for people that are listening? Maybe where to start or just something simple that people can engage in? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important that we practice uh, coming into ourselves, into our embodied experience, uh, first with a sense of, of working on regulation and resourcing ourselves. So my teacher, Mariah Moser, who I study with for relational somatic therapy, she talked about making pleasure a value. So mm. uh, because it, we're negatively biased uh, perceptually, right? Because it's a survival strategy. So mm. the whole thrust of positive psychology is that we actually have to try to pay attention to positive things. But when we do, and then we rehearse that, we start to pay more attention to positive things or pleasant things. And when we do that, like we, you know, study the color of the sky at sunset or notice something beautiful about the the season like right now in vancouver we've got these gorgeous uh, cherry blossoms on the Ooh, trees nice. and and when we pause and take it in and then take a moment to go how do i feel in my body right now as i take this in we mm. start to build capacity to feel into ourselves in those uh, in those ways when we're enjoying pleasure and that can really help, especially, you know, for those of us who have had trauma, we've needed to disconnect from experience. Maybe we don't have as much tolerance for experience because it is so uncomfortable in our bodies because of what we're carrying with us from the past. It's those things, I think, that can really help us start to build capacity. And the same goes for when we're working with clients. You know, I always work on building capacity and resource first. 
So that's just a simple practice to do. And that that's actually really nice to do. It's really yeah. nice to pay attention to those things. Um, and it's then, definitely part of my practice, just being able to slow down, take a big breath, yeah. take in nature, the scenery. and Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then, you know, I just also just like the word pause or pause, relax, open. You know, I just when, when that, I practice that, the more, when you do formal practices like sitting meditation, it's true. The more you do it as a practice, the more it becomes part of your disposition. Again, right. because of neuroplasticity and shaping what we pay attention to. Um, but, you know, so when, when things are maybe somewhat unpleasant or maybe we've got a craving to go do something, to go pause. Oh, can I pay attention to this discomfort right now? Where is this discomfort? Can I be okay with it? Can I give it description? What's the color? What's the shape? And, you know, just practicing also in those moments of more difficulty and being able to give experience description, to be present to it. Um, and again, that's building our, our, our capacity to um, be present to what is, you know, unpleasant. And ultimately that increases psychological flexibility. Ultimately, you know, it's a whole other conversation we don't have time for today. But just around psychological flexibility and distress tolerance and how experiences with psychedelics can be pivotal to help people learn, like, actually, I can be with this, you know, or this isn't as scary. I can lean in maybe because of the, the help of the medicine and the holding environment. Um, and that really opens up to a platform of choice when we learn, when we stretch our capacity that way. In a lot of ways, I think that's what really healing is about, is actually about stretching our capacity to attend to our lives and to then respond to our lives from choice in alignment with our values, you know, as opposed to wanting to change our internal experience because it's uncomfortable and we want it to stop. And, uh, you know, and that, and that's really the thrust of what psychological flexibility is about and acceptance and commitment therapy, which is also some of the underpinnings of, of the programs and how we, how we do things within numinous um, in terms of our approach. Wonderful. Speaking of Numinous, um, what are you guys up to and, and any updates? Yeah. Um, so Numinous, we've, uh, we're, we've launched and we've been doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy for depression as well as awesome. PTSD and all of our clinics. And I'm very much enjoying um, being in a clinical role, having really worked on establishing the programs and, and behind the scenes for a long time and really seeing it all um, come to fruition. Uh, Numinous, of course, is involved in assisting with the, the MAPS uh, USX study, and um, we are continuing to expand um, our pro programs and services, especially the supportive services that kind of wrap around psychedelic-assisted therapy. Uh, so uh, in the fall, you know, launching some uh, community-based uh, integration circles that are free, um, and Wonderful. also uh, launching some programs related to um, working with non-ordinary states of consciousness and preparing with mindfulness-based approaches, um, these types of things. So lots of exciting um, different uh, programs that will weave in and I think really help people to connect with community and also really work on, on the preparation side uh, as well as the integration side of, of their experiences. Wonderful. Sounds really exciting. Um, what type of ketamine are you guys working with and what do your protocols look like? Yeah, so we're working with sublingual and intranasal ketamine. Uh, we don't use IM. Uh, in Canada, the regulations around IM have been quite strict. Uh, recently under review. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, our, our sublingual rapid dissolving tablets, we range from 100 to 300 milligrams and then followed by a supplemental intranasal dose at 20 to 30 minutes. Um, if the person is wanting to go deeper, then they have that option for an intranasal supplement of 30 to 60 milligrams. And I find, you know, especially at the higher dose states, we, we tend to titrate it up over time. We start on the lower scale. It's maybe a little bit more of a psycholytic session. Um, but that's really, it's really important. It's actually really important, especially with folks I with trauma. So. In yeah, building rapport and building trust and dipping the toe into the medicine and then knowing, okay, yeah, I do feel good to go up next time or you know, maybe that actually felt really good. And we got a lot out of that session when I was still really talking with you a lot. And I, but I felt more relaxed. And so there's, there's a lot of range and choice there. But when we do get to the higher, um, to the high end of that dose spectrum, it is quite um, psychedelic, and it is approaching, you know, the 1.5 milligram per kilogram intramuscular um, oh, wow. in terms of its effect. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's it's just really not as sudden of an onset yeah, and yeah, offset as, yeah. as the IM. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, we, 
uh, we do have a, a suggested protocol that involves two to three preparatory sessions and then the ketamine sessions, which are two and a half hours, um, followed the next day with a 75 minute integration session. And then we repeat that. But, you know, it's really in our model is um, a lot of flexibility. If we feel people need more prep, you know, we 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 tell people up front that we're not going to necessarily push right into ketamine sessions if you know, if we think clinically it's inappropriate to go there, we need yeah. to do more prep. And then, you know, we can space out the sessions as well. They don't have to be weekly. We can, that's our sort of baseline, but um, things can be customized uh, for folks. And oh, yeah, it sounds wonderful. It is really amazing, you know, to really see it, it's certainly, it's a brief a psychological intervention. You yeah. know, these are clients coming to us that have connected, they have connections to support in the community. That's really important. We're not just taking in people and then they go out and, and then they don't have resources. We're, we're part of a continuum of care. And, um, but it, it really is amazing to see um, the type of transformation that can happen even from a brief intervention that way, especially when the treatment expectations are realistic. And that's all part of PrEP too. You know, we frame things that, this is going to be a step on a lifelong healing journey, right? So we can have these long-term goals, and then together we we talk about you know what are the intentions for each se each session for the unfolding towards those long-term goals, and um, yeah, it's been really rewarding so far to see people awesome. come through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, I'm wondering, has there been either a challenge that you've confronted kind of stepping more into this work with ketamine or maybe any like insights that maybe we've challenged on how you wanted to show up? Um, how I want to show up as a therapist or how? Yeah, how yeah. Or just even around your expectations on how it should be done. Like, I'm just wondering, you know, you're kind of saying being in the background, kind of developing stuff and then actually stepping into the work and, you know, how it's nice. And I wonder what your process has been like that and maybe how it's challenged you or just any insights mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. your process of stepping into the work. For sure. I mean, it's been really valuable to be part of our therapist community of practice. We have peer supervision weekly. So everyone who's doing CAP therapy is, is showing up and discussing their cases and, you know, where where the hard points or sticky points are. And they've been those things, especially when the therapists were early on and maybe they learned in their training around realistic expectations, but they didn't necessarily with their first client really emphasize that as much. And then the client's expectations end up being, you know, disappointed and, you know, people learn through experience about, oh, actually how really important it is. Like all of these things mm -hmm. that are outlined in the manual of what's important to emphasize before any medicine is delivered are there for a reason. You know, another one is like the, what, uh, the rubber band effect or what maps in their training calls mind robbers, where, um, you know, a person, um, has a big experience, maybe discloses something they've carried a lot of shame around for the first time. And then the next day, rubber band, all their protectors come back, tell them that was awful. You never should have said that um, Try and attempt to invalidate the experience mm. they have. It, and but as part of prep, we say, you know, that's actually really natural because, you know, put, bringing a medicine on board can soften the protectors and it's natural for them to want to reestablish the status quo after the fact, especially if you kind of artificially soften them. Um, and so we can expect that you may have thoughts the next day around, um, you know, that really wasn't as meaningful as I thought it was, or, or just doubting the experience. And when people are prepared for that, it's way more easy to have some cognitive distance and um, like just sort of see it as a phenomenon that's expected to happen. And, and part of the whole um, psychological flexibility approach as well is learning how to decenter and defuse and notice our thoughts and, and not necessarily be so, so um, fused with our negative perceptions and beliefs and psychedelics can absolutely be powerful in helping to pull, tease that all apart. So um, I think it's really just these lessons that we're learning as clinicians of really yeah. the, the keen importance of all these different elements of, uh, especially in preparation that are really important to support people. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, I see that we're coming at time here and I feel like we could just keep going on and on. Um, but I'm, yeah. And I, I wanted to touch on one other topic, but maybe we'll save that for, for vital. But, you know, I think this is a really important um, discussion that, that we'll be uh, doing a session on around therapist self care. Um, mm -hmm. And I love to just maybe hear some, you know, quick thoughts around that. Um, I, I'm really big on it. I, I think it is important that we all take care of ourselves and burnout is a very real thing. Um, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and I think when we don't take care of ourselves and we expect like just put our energy too too much in different places, this is when harms do happen, right? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, just any quick thoughts on on therapist self care before we close out here? Sure, uh, it's certainly an ethical imperative that we're maintaining our fitness to practice by practicing diligent self care. You know, I can't be you know a resonant embodiment of wholeness and integration and health if that's not my experience and what I'm living. And if I'm not living and experiencing that and showing up uh, in therapeutic work with folks, you know, there's there's really, there's a big gap there. Um, and so it's incumbent upon us, like our body, mind, and our nervous system is our therapeutic inst- instrument. You know, mm. I know Stan Groff talks about the scalpel and um, I think recently on a podcast with, uh, was it Laura May? Um, you know, just talking about our, our body as like the instrument. And so the care of that is so, so, so important. And the unique considerations in psychedelic work, I think, relate to some of what we've already talked about today, um, the countertransference and the enhanced intimacy and how that might pull us in ways that we're not accustomed to from our ordinary practice and be stressful and how to navigate that well and how to navigate charged topics like touch and and sex and sexual energy, which can absolutely come up in psychedelic mm-hmm. experiences. Um, and just, you know, the prolonged session duration and, you know, elements of working in co-therapy with someone that ideally is going to be a resourcing thing, but might be the opposite if we opposite, don't have, yeah. you know, great communication. And so there's a lot of different considerations, but I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are super eager to do this work and, you know, I've heard about people cramming it into their weekends because they've got a full therapeutic, you know, ordinary practice during the week. And it's like, it's not a good idea. You know, that's, it's going to definitely lead to lead to burnout because somebody needs extra integration. And then you're just very, very quickly beyond capacity and overwhelmed. So I think we need to think about how frequently we're even doing um, it's psychedelic sessions in our practice versus kind of the chop wood carry water of right. our ordinary practice um, because of the demands that it that it has. So, and I think that's kind of linked to a, a closing point, maybe that uh, for me is I think the yardstick on um, how far we're, we're, we're going with this psychedelic work is that, um, you know, either personally in our own journeys or even in the folks we're supporting, we're getting to a place where we don't need the psychedelics right? Mm-hmm. Where the psychedelics has, have given us a reference. They've opened up new vistas of possibility. They've helped us to approach our lives differently, such that we are now cultivating the, the quality of presence and the quality of, um, you know, investigation and curiosity and flexibility and all those things that psychedelics can bring us in our ordinary lives. Like to mm-hmm. me, I think for many of us, psychedelics are like this fascinating frontier but then when you sort of come out the other side, it's like, well, life, real life is, is a ceremony and Very trippy, <laughs> absolutely trippy, fascinating frontier. And how I meet it, you know, is, is, is such a, um, a powerful thing that, um, so that we've got these tools and they can help us learn and they can help us connect. And then hopefully we can come full circle and, you know, we can drop the tools and just be able to live uh, meaningful lives. Um, that are sustaining for ourselves and, and for each other. I love that. And I think that's a, a wonderful place to close and also maybe a challenging idea for, for some people um, in, in this world. But um, yeah, I think from my experience that that's really been it, um, you know, use it as a tool. And, um, you know, I think the point is to how do we live happier, fuller lives without it? Always mm-hmm. revisit, right? When we need it, like a tune-up. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, yeah. My and, my I practice mean, has really been about embodiment, and just and we... I don't pretend to say that that is the right way to view things, right? I mean, I, I right, share yeah, from my it's... own experience, and you know, people who are really on a path and they're providing medicine for folks, you know, plant medicine, ceremonial work, you know, it may just be your whole path and your whole life, and not to say that that's wrong by any means. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that little caveat there. Because yeah. <clears throat> that is yeah. probably an important part of many people's lives if that's Absolutely. what they're really doing. Um, yeah. Awesome. So yeah, wonderful place to close out. Um, any Anything else you want to share? Any events, any links that you want to toss out there? Uh, well, I think it just the best place to reach me and follow me is uh, my Instagram handle at Dr. Devin Christie, because I often post sort of talks I've given, um, other things there. Um, 
yeah, it's been it's been really exciting. There's been a lot of uh, amazing invitations. I spoke at the American Academy for the Advancement of Science uh, this oh, year wow. in February nice. on a panel beside Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, um, which was just a career milestone, a career, a career <laughs> high for me for sure. Yeah. Um, but just the fact that the AAAS brought in a psychedelics panel is really testament to the advancing of the field and you know yeah. these these very um, uh, you know, um, traditional institutions of science, um, really being willing to, to open the door and that have these discussions. Huge. Yeah. So it's exciting. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, just look forward to more. Awesome. Well, Dr. Devin Chrissy, really appreciate your time and thank you for everybody listening. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much, Kyle. It's been a pleasure.